Bonjour, bienvenue euh, et merci d'être venu en si grand nombre en ce samedi pluvieux euh, à cette conversation euh, entre euh, Patricia Feely, Greg Hill et Dwayne Linklater euh, autour euh, des, de l'art euh, autochtone, l'art contemporain autochtone. Euh, en commençant, je veux juste vous dire que la conversation va se passer en anglais. Euh, cependant, les gens qui ont des questions, euh, ou, ou à un moment donné, on va ouvrir ça à, à des questions. Si vous avez des questions en français, ça nous ferait plaisir. Euh, ça me ferait plaisir de les traduire pour ceux qui, qui, qui en ont besoin et les réponses, et ainsi de suite aussi. Mais pour euh, le cours de la conversation, on fera ça en anglais. Euh, on va commencer euh, par euh, des brèves euh, présentations de nos panélistes et puis euh, ensuite, on va enchaîner euh, rapidement. Alors voilà. Merci. Um, thank you everybody for being here on this uh, wonderfully rainy Saturday afternoon, such a nice turnout. And uh, thank you Papier for having us uh, organizing these series of conversations. Uh, merci Papier, uh, génial. And uh, just to know that the con I'm going to do the preliminaries in English, uh, French and English, but the conversation will be taking place in English. Uh, but, your qu uh, but people who have questions in French, I'll translate and vice versa. All right, so um, our first speak, our first, not speaker, but our first uh, guest today, uh, Greg A. Hill, was born and raised in Fort Erie, Ontario. Uh, he is a uh, Ganyagahaga uh, Mohawk member of Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and is also a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, Greg's curatorial work began uh, with independent exhibitions in 1998 and contract work at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, followed by employment at the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, beginning in 2000, uh, to work in the integration of Aboriginal art within the gallery's historical Canadian art galleries, Art of This Land, in 2003. In 2006, as assistant curator of contemporary art, Hill curated the first ever solo exhibition of the National Gallery of Canada uh, of a First Nation artist, Norval Morisot, a shaman artist. In 2007, this is the big one, Gre uh, Greg became the inaugural Odane curator of Indigenous art and head of the Department of, Indig of Indigenous Art. In 2010, uh, Greg organized the retrospective Carl Beam, The Poetics of Being. In 2013, uh, he, he co-curated with Christine Lalonde and Candace Hopkins, Sakahan, International Indigenous Art, the largest uh, exhibition ever produced by the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, the first ever global survey of contemporary Indigenous art and the inaugural exhibition for an ongoing series of international contemporary Indigenous art exhibitions to occur at the NGC every five years. As head of the National Gallery's Department of Indigenous Art, Greg has overseen a significant increase in the size of the collection of Indigenous art. In the last five years, adding nearly 400 works, totaling well over 2,000 works. Um, next to him is uh, Dwayne, uh, maybe I'll, yeah, no, I'll do all the bios first, get that out of the way, and then we can continue. Dwayne Linklater is um, a uh, Cree from uh, Moose Cree First Nation in Northern Ontario, and is currently based in North Bay, Ontario. He was educated at the University of Alberta, receiving Bachelor of, Fine, uh, Bachelor of Native Studies and a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Dwayne attended Milton Avery Graduate School uh, of, of Arts at uh, Bard College in upstate New York, completing his Master of Fine Arts in Film and Video. Uh, Dwayne produces a range of work, including video and film installation performance, sculptural objects, and often works within the context of cooperative and collaborative gestures. He has exhibited and screened his work nationally and internationally at the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Art Gallery of Alberta, Family Business Gallery in New York City, the Power Plant in Toronto, and a recent collaboration with uh, Tanya Lucan Linklater at MoCA Toronto. Um, his collaborative film project with Brian Youngen, Modest Livelihood, uh, was originally presented at the Walter Phillips Gallery at the Banff Centre in collaboration with Documenta 13, uh, with subsequent exhibitions of his work at the Logan Centre for Gallery at University of Chicago, and uh, Catriona Jeffries uh, Gallery in Vancouver and at the AGO uh, currently in Toronto. Uh, Dwayne is a recipient of the 2013 Sobe Art Award and uh, participated in the Beat Nation exhibition currently on tour at, uh, and showing now at the Dalhousie Art Gallery in St. Mary's University and another part of it at, um, yeah, that Dalhousie in St. Mary's, that's right. Uh, Modest Livelihood is currently, I don't know if I said that, at the AGO. And Dwayne will be participating in the upcoming exhibition, Attention Economy, at Kunsthalle Wein, uh, which is up soon. And uh, he will also be participating in ICA at 50 at the Philadelphia ICA uh, in, as of June 2014. 
our, and last but not least, Patricia Feely is a director of Feely Fine Arts, a contemporary art gallery specializing in the in quality original Inuit art from across the Canadian uh, Arctic. Uh, the gallery is located in downtown Toronto and is a member of the uh, Art Dealers Association of Canada. She is also uh, an art historian specializing in the field of uh, Inuit art, having obtained her um, degrees at University of Toronto. Yes. Um, She's the long-term director of the gallery. Oh, this is not my up-to-date bio, so I'm just, just going to end, end it there. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start off uh, by passing the microphone over to Greg, who has um, quite a bit to talk about in relation to his role at the National Gallery, I believe, and so on. Um, I just want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come here to speak at uh, the Paper Festival. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about uh, what I do in the context of Indigenous art at the National Gallery of Canada from, in a medium-specific way. It's not something that I, um, I would normally do, but to think about paper uh, and paper at the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, paper, paper, the history of paper, uh, did you know? <laughs> uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia tells us that uh, uh, the Chinese invented paper in 200 BC. Um, as you know, this is following uh, the Egyptians and, uh, and the use of papyrus, but, uh, but, the, but uh, the, uh, the relationship of paper to the National Gallery of Canada, um, the earliest paperworks dated that, that are in the collection of the National Gallery of Canada are uh, mid 15th century, um, European in origin. Uh, Dutch, German, Italian. Um, it's quite an extensive collection that the gallery has. And I'll read you some statistics uh, that break down in a, in a medium-specific way the, the paper at the National Gallery of Canada. And that's essentially uh, what I'm going to do uh, today, talk a little bit about that, but more specifically about, uh, I think I've selected five or six artists that are in the contemporary indigenous art collection um, who work with paper, but as you uh, know, you know, uh, in your familiarity with paper as collectors, as artists, as, as dealers, as curators, that uh, of course artists use paper in many, many different ways. It's, uh, so it's not, even though we're thinking about uh, a specific medium, the way that it's employed uh, and thought about the processes, um, artists come to the use of that medium in, in very, very different ways. So that kind of diversity of approach is something that uh, that I think you know, I, I don't want to say we take for granted, but but that's something that's a presupposition maybe that we can make in when we're looking at the use of paper in contemporary Indigenous art because. Uh, because it, it is that diverse, and those approaches are diverse. Um, so, you know, the, the National Gallery of Canada has a collection that numbers around uh, 45,000 individual works. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, the, you know, there's quite a long history uh, in terms of paper at the National Gallery of Canada. Um, the bulk of the collection is in the uh, international prints and drawings collections and the Canadian prints and drawings collections. The international prints and drawings has uh, well over 7,000 works, 7,500 works. Uh, Canadian prints and drawings, 6,500. Uh, and then there are an additional just under 300 works in the, in the contemporary Canadian prints and drawings collection. Um, of that, a smaller number, 41 works that are international artists in the contemporary collection. Um, and then there are in the historical collection, historical, and this is the way, the, this, uh, categories are a funny thing too, so the, the way that the National Gallery categorizes their collections, historical Asian uh, grouped together with non-Western, uh, 42 works. Okay, so uh, indigenous, the indigenous collection, and of course, when we're talking about uh, categories, what do we mean by indigenous? That uh, in Canada is Aboriginal or First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, but it means people of indigenous origins self-identified anywhere in the world. Okay, so that's a, a large group of people. It's, it, 
Uh, it's not a group in a homogenous way. It's, it's, uh, it's a categorization that uh, is as diverse as you can possibly imagine. Um, so within, that, within the collection of indigenous art at the National Gallery, there are uh, well over 2,000 works now in the collection, and just over 1,100 of those are works on paper. Um, that, uh, that then breaks down to uh, about 100 of those works are from First Nations artists, over 1,000 are Inuit artists, and so they make up the bulk of the collection. I think Pat would have something to say about that today. Um, and then, uh, as you know from, uh, from the, the biography and some of the exhibition activities that I've been involved in recently, and most recently the Saga Han exhibition that happened at the gallery this summer, uh, which was about international indigenous art, um, the building of the collection uh, and, and really moving beyond North America uh, to think about uh, indigenous art in a global context. So that collection was in part a way of expanding, sorry, that exhibition was in part a way of expanding the collection. So, that, so there are, as a result of that, um, 24 works by uh, international indigenous artists. And you'll see a couple of those examples. So, um, well, there's one there. So that was a work that, that featured in Saga Han in the summer. It's a, it's a work by Danny Mellor, who's uh, an artist from Australia. And it's, uh, he's an artist that works with a, a history of, of uh, colonial, settler colonialism, uh, commenting on that through the use of, uh, in this case, references to willowware. So this kind of imperialistic uh, notion uh, of, of the Oriental, uh, because willowware is, is a construction, uh, not uh, as a reference to to uh, to, to Asian uh, teaware, but it's but it's really designed and invented in the UK. Um, so that's a detail of that work. Uh, Mabala Irugi uh, of Power and Darkness. It was a work that was created for Saga Han, uh, and specifically uh, what, one of the things that Danny does is embed Swarovski crystals in the surface of the, uh, the paper, and these two pieces of paper were installed above uh, the triptych piece, and they were backlit, and it was a way of uh, recreating uh, the sky uh, above uh, Ottawa at the time of the opening of the exhibition, so he time, he actually looked at what the what the celestial bodies would be in the sky above Ottawa, and created those uh, around the skull image in Swarovski crystals. So there's this really nice connection to to uh, to the locality of Ottawa, but from an artist, you know, uh, all the way uh, as far away as as Australia. So it was a really great way of connecting. Um, these kinds of opposite, these poles of the world. Um, next artist would be Shuvanai Shuna. So Shuvanai Shuna, of course, is an Inuit artist uh, from Canada, from Cape Dorset, uh, born in 1961. Another uh, artist like Annie Pudiguk, who comes from uh, a line, an artistic lineage. Um, this work too was featured in, in Art of This Land this summer. It's called Untitled Big Pink Flowers. And it's really just, uh, I think, just you know, one example of how uh, Shuvenai works in these two different kinds of spaces, you know, the real world and a fantasy world, and how she co combines that in her work. Um, so I just wanted to, to show that as well. How about the next image? This just briefly is uh, a work by Lawrence Polly Hoylepton, who is, uh, you could say, an artist, an activist, uh, along his family. He has a long history in his family in political activism, um, and I think that transfers through his art. This, so this was a, actually from a performance piece that he did, and, and we'll just go to the next one. Um, because it was a performance that he enacted uh, three times in the UK and then he did again 
in uh, Kittigan Zibi, north of Ottawa, Algonquin Territory. And uh, it's called an Indian Act, shooting the Indian Act. Um, so the play on the words, of course, the Indian Act is the legislation that, uh, that governs uh, many aspects of uh, uh, Indian life in Canada. It still exists. Um, but this piece here is another one that he did. He wasn't, uh, let's go back, please. He wasn't only shooting copies of the Indian Act, but he would shoot other copies of legislation, in this case, Bill C-7, the First Nations Governance Act. Um, <clears throat> do this, he would, he would make this a performance, invite people, and then, uh, then these would be the, the objects, the, the, uh, the, left, the artifacts of the performance um, afterwards. So the shotgun shells, uh, the shot up pieces of legislation became the, the representations of that, of that act. Um, next one. So Carl Beam, I think too, I wanted to show uh, a work from him. He's, uh, I think, an important artist in the collection of the National Gallery, uh, very much known, uh, his piece, his work, for kind of like breaking the doors open at the National Gallery to contemporary First Nations art uh, with his work, uh, the North American Iceberg, uh, 1985 piece. It wasn't on paper, it was actually on plexiglass. but. Uh, but it became so symbolic for, for uh, a change at the gallery, a change in its collecting practices uh, leading up to 1992 and uh, the Land Spirit Power exhibition um, and the, 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 the kind of growing uh, of the collection, uh, work starting to come into the collection by, by First Nations artists, um, First Nations and Métis artists. There's the history with Inuit art at the National Gallery goes back quite a bit further, but um, but I wanted to show uh, a Carl Beam work as a reference to that as well. So I'll just move to the next one. I wanted to also make a nod to Joan Cardinal Schubert, um, an another of that generation of artists uh, like Carl Beam, those artists that were really trailblazers. Uh, for younger generations. Um, Joan Cardinal Schubert, also very politically active, uh, created a, a lot of work that dealt with residential schools. Um, <clears throat> those kinds of things, uh, environmental disasters, this piece in particular is referencing the, the Exxon Valdez spill in, in 1988. Um, can we look at the detail? but also the history of residential schools, and obviously the, the central motif is, is a cross, so the impact of religions uh, in those things. But you can see, hopefully in the detail, that there are these uh, small bundles. So those are uh, 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 children wrapped in, in blankets, um, but, it's, but then it's kind of like you think about the effect of the oil spill, uh, how this paper looks, uh, that, those, that kind of damage and, and what the effects of, of that, of Christianity, of residential schools are on Aboriginal peoples in a, in a contemporary context. Um, and I think uh, we have one more slide, which is a, a recent acquisition by uh, Chief Henry Speck. Uh, chief Henry Speck was a hereditary chief of the Kwakwakwa people and uh, a Hamatsa dancer, but he also uh, was an artist and he created a lot of these works in the early 60s and had shows in, in the early 60s, you know, at a time where uh, this wasn't a, a popular thing to do, that it, that it wasn't even, uh, and Daphne Ojeg at that time was hiding the fact that she was an Aboriginal artist um, so that she could get shows, so that she could be an artist trying to define herself uh, in, in a, in a non-Aboriginal way. So, so here's uh, Chief Speck, uh, something very, very much putting that out there that he's not, that he has a deep cultural knowledge, but uh, as a participant and do, creating many, many watercolors uh, about this, about this kind of work. So, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and, uh, and we all want to hear from Dwayne, so.
Thank you. It's very loud. Um, first of all, thank you to Papier uh, to invite me here to talk about things. Um, I have a, just a short um, thing to talk about. I, I wasn't sure what to talk about. Uh, I didn't really want to talk about myself, so I didn't put any of my own work in the slides. Um, I thought it was weird to sort of uh, put my own work or something. I don't know. Anyways, so what I decided to do is I, I chose um, three things, um, three artists and three examples of these artists' works, um, which had some kind of effect on me in some kind of a way. Um, the effect is still sort of uh, unfolding and unraveling itself uh, as to how. Uh, a lot of the time, I think it's just something. Uh, when I look at this picture by Annie Puttaguk, um, it's a it's a beautiful picture, and there are things that that um, I like about it. Right there, there are things that I admire about it. Um, some formal things, color, this sort of thing, composition, these these sorts of things. But uh, again, there are parts of the uh, picture which. Um, uh, sort of move much uh, further away from these formalities of, of making art and um, uh, uh, they begin to speak about her and her context um, the person that is Annie Puktaguk and, and what she sees and what she feels and what she uh, wants to show you and talk about um, to me for this work uh, was a departure uh, uh, in, in um, uh, in, in my opinion, anyways, is a departure from um, from what many people, both uh, Inuit and First Nations artists, were doing in and around this time. Uh, so this this art, this kind of work, became very important to me in terms of um, simply um, delivering a a document, um, a document about life um, as she saw it, as she wants to show you. Uh, to me, it becomes very, very real and very, very honest and very sincere. And these are qualities that, that I find um, um, powerful and real. And uh, again, as well, that um, for this particular work, these are, the, these are some of the reasons why I like this artwork. But again, um, you know, five years from now, that might very much change. I know that I will still like it but I think maybe I might like it for different reasons. So it has a, a particular um, quality about it that maybe uh, language does not serve it well in terms of, I might not be able to name exactly why in words, why I like it. And I think that's a lot of what I see and do, um, I like that thing, whatever that thing is called. Um, I like it. So, um, but this particular picture, uh, and I use the word document, uh, it's a particular word and I think it's an important word uh, in, in terms of some of the things that I've been doing over the past couple of years. Uh, my project with Brian, uh, this, is the, this is the word that, that we sort of use uh, to describe modest livelihood, um, which is a 50 minute silent film about Brian and I hunting. Uh, we shot it on super 16 millimeter film, and um, this is the the word that that uh, both of us have sort of agreed upon to describe what modest livelihood is. It's not a documentary, right? It, it might have sort of components of documentary involved in it, but I don't think it is a documentary. It's it's different, right? Uh, maybe we'll go to the next one. Speaking of which. Um, these artists, that there's three of them here that I'm going to show and talk about. Um, this was in 2011 at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and this is a show that Brian Youngen did. And I had uh, uh, this is when we were making uh, Modest Livelihood at the time, and um, so we were just hanging out, and I got to walk through the show um, and spend some time there with his works. Uh, this was in 2011. Uh, I, I thought that this was very, very important uh, in terms of um, 
the artist, uh, the artist and his, his or her intentions and, and the work's intentions. Uh, and the work being able to sort of have a conversation in particular with a, 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 um, a collection. And I think that this is a very important thing and, and being very specific about how you want your artworks to uh, um, have some kind of conversation in the context of the collection. So in the context of the Art Gallery Ontario, in the context of Henry Moore. Um, I think that was just an incredible, for me, an incredible decision on Brian's part, not only just to, to, he could have put it in the contemporary galleries upstairs in a white space and just had these amazing sculptures in that space. And I think that would have been a great choice. And I still would have liked the sculptures, but I think he wanted to do something else at this point. And I think um, this little shift again um, that, that he's done in terms of uh, uh, um, wanting to have some kind of conversation with uh, the AGO and the history of the AGO and this sort of titan of, of modernist uh, um, uh, sculpture. Of course, that this is, uh, you know, th there's a, an extensive and well-known history of what sort of, um, uh, how should I say, uh, what, what, what makes the foundation and what goes into uh, the modernist person the modern sculpture, the modernist sculpture, and the modernist sculptures themselves. So I think that uh, having Brian's work in that sort of conversation is really important. And I think it's, uh, again, one of these things where I like it and I don't want to sort of uh, reduce it too much in terms of how I'm going to describe it. So um, this for me was, was a, uh, this idea of uh, having one's artwork sort of um, in some ways, collaborate with uh, the curator and um, um, things are dripping on me. Sorry, um, collaborate with <laughs> the uh, uh, the curator and the institution itself. Um, I, I thought that was a very, very um, uh, amazing choice by Brian, but also an influential one because I was working with him at the time and. Uh, uh, um, this this particular choice had a big, and this particular show had a big impact of, on me in terms of uh, me thinking, uh, what it, what it, what is he doing? Basically, that was like the question, right? Um, and, and I got, you know, it, it changes all the time again. It's it's he's doing something because I had an experience in this place years ago at the AGO when before the uh, renovations took place. Like, I went into the Henry Moore Gallery. It's this dark, it was really dark and brooding and kind of scary kind of place with these sort of mystical sculptures. Anyways, so we'll go to the next one. And so this uh, picture, we're, look, we're, we're looking at the two photos side by side there. This, this artwork had a really big influence on me. And... I'm not sure how widely known this artwork is, but I would like it to be widely known. I would like to, I would like people to know about him and um, this artwork in particular because I think it's such an excellent artwork. So this artist is Edward Poitras, um, and this artwork is offensive defensive. Um, so what he did was, uh, I think it was the the gallery in Regina, and his home reserve. So what he did was he cut out two strips of land and switched them. I thought that that was a, such a insightful, sort of very, very uh, remarkable thing to think about. You know, you can think about things. You know, think about ideas of um, artworks, but it, it's another thing to have the thoughts and the ideas, and then to sort of execute it. Really, sort of. Uh, with such great economy, I guess, would be the sort of correct terminology, maybe, um, and say, okay, I've switched these two pieces of land, uh, and then he lets it go. And I think that this idea of um, this artwork uh, where you sort of place things in a situation, and then, uh, then it's, it's, it's interesting to me that the artist at that point can take many steps back, because then it's, it's just sort of a system um, that, that is sort of self-regenerating, uh, i.e. grass, living things. 
um, and it does what it does after the, after the fact. Um, so as far as I know, one strip died and one didn't. Um, this is, to me, uh, um, in, in the essay, uh, I can't remember which book it was, but Gerald McMaster talks about this artwork as being, um, uh, I think he describes it as being deceiving. I thought it was an interesting sort of term to describe it. I think that's all I'm going to say. Hi. If, if you can't hear me because I'm very soft-spoken, just wave or whatever. Um, I'd like to thank Papier for inviting me, and I can't tell you, um, it's an honor and a privilege to share the stage with a curator and an artist, and, uh, and I'm quite enjoying it. So, um, Before I begin to speak to the images that I've brought, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. All of the images that I've brought, and you've seen two of the artists already, are in fact from uh, the settlement on Baffin Island, southwest Baffin Island of Cape Dorset. And there's a reason why, when we're talking about works on paper and particularly contemporary drawing, why I will only be speaking about Cape Dorset. A studio was started there, a printing studio, in the late 1950s. It is still, still active. It's actually the longest standing print studio in Canada at the current moment. And as I'm sure you're all aware, for years and years, very iconic prints were, were put out by this studio, and in fact, till today, there's still annual collections. Drawings were not, in fact, shown in this earlier time period. Uh, there wasn't a history of drawing to start with because, in fact, there was very little paper. As the Inuit, who were um, slowly settling in the settlements, were actually just approached to do drawings, but for years and years, these drawings tended to be mainly basically a fodder for an image bank for the creation of prints. And so they very seldom made it out. They therefore, to some degree, began to reflect what the expectation of the prints would be. If you have a Dorset image, then in fact, the people who were doing the drawings tended to stay in that kind of, as I say, market expectation if you want to be, uh, but certainly um, it is market expectation, but it's also just what people think Inuit art should look like. And this continued up, you know, really through the 1990s. Um, Dorset really tried very hard to, uh, to introduce new methods. They did bring up someone to introduce acrylic painting. Um, Mr. Macknick, who's sitting here in the audience, uh, held a, an oil stick workshop. And, uh, um, but in fact, as I say, the drawings were not very much affected until very early, well, in fact, in 2001, I visited Cape Dorset and the uh, lithographer who'd been working there said, find these drawings because they won't show them to you by Annie Pudigu. And I went and I found them and was absolutely stunned by them went running across the road to say, I need to take six of these home with me because I had a show coming up that they would fit. And was told by the then Inuit manager that I would never sell them, that, you know, that people would never accept this as Inuit art. Quite the opposite, of course. Um, you know, Annie was included in my show in 2001. She had my first solo in 2003. She went on to win the Sobe Award, went to Documenta. And two very important things happened there. One is because of that recognition down south and her show at the power plant in Toronto, the southern market suddenly realized that, that in fact there could be Inuit art that, could, that is contemporary, that is not like the 40 years before. More importantly to the north, it sent back the message that you should draw what you want. Don't worry about, don't worry about the expectation and you will be successful. So Annie, uh, following in the footsteps, actually, of her mother, talked about day-to-day -day life. She said she couldn't talk about traditional life because she didn't live it. And she addressed uh, very, very boldly the problems, the spousal abuse, physical abuse, alcoholism. At the same time, though, like the, like the uh, uh, drawing that Duane showed, she just showed day-to-day -day life in the Arctic, but in such a direct way that it was, it was stunning. So... Since that time, since about 2005, so we're only talking really 10 years, 
an extraordinary thing has happened in that studio. It's a large drawing studio. Five or six artists work there together. It's the only studio in, in the Arctic where, in fact, there is a, or the only settlement where there's a drawing studio. So I'm just going to give you a quick sort of overview of some of the artists and what they're doing and the changes. This is uh, Shuvanai Ashuna, and who again you've already seen a slide of. Shuvanai was creating art, was creating drawings right through the 90s. I actually have at my booth a couple of small examples of her work. She was doing small pen and ink landscapes, some of them only 8 by 10 inches, um, quite, you know, very, very detailed. Um, flash forward 10 years, and she's, you know, she's doing something like this where effectively she just let her imagination run and um, very different from Annie, uh, but she, she has a, a freedom and a fantasy life that is extraordinary as well as the most amazing sense of color. So Shuv and I changed her style. This is another example of someone who changed his style. He had been drawing since the 1960s, did quite wonderful, small, um, very whimsical birds and things based on traditional life. As he came into the studio, having retired, as he started working in the studio, he started looking at what people around him were doing and immediately decided he wanted some of this large-scale paper because by this time they were working up to, you know, four by eight feet. And suddenly his entire, entire style changed. And out of this very detailed, you know, little narrative, you know, formerly narrative style, he started, he never really leaves the subject matter behind, in this case the caribou are obvious, but just look at what he did with the landscape. This would never have come out, and this was made when he was in his mid-70s, so he was very, very late in having this change. So again, without this kind of revolution in up there, Ohotak would never have been able to have um, starred as much as he did. Another artist and another innovation. Uh, really, in Cape Dorset, it's surprising. Really, only one person is working in photography as a medium. The artists in the studio use photography. They go out and use it, but they don't actually use it as an end means. I.T. Pudagu, who sadly passed away several weeks ago, I.T. preferred to work from his own photographs initially. He tried to be an artist earlier, but basically in the 80s was told that what he was doing, people weren't interested in Inuit art that was based on photographs. Um, but then he was very much welcome. So this brings in a whole new image bank, if you will, and there's a wonderful collaboration between another studio artist whose images IT would work. But this started as a photograph of an oil tank. Um, it's currently in the Art Gallery of Ontario collection. And IT would totally reinterpret it and give it that wonderful tranquil stillness that he has. Jutai Tunu. Uh, again, you know, all of these artists are working side by side and they all have very, very different styles. Jutai is probably the most... Uh, the most likely to do social commentary, this being the Nunavut health care plan. Um, and he's also the most experimental. He does work in acrylic. He does work in oil stick more than pencil crayon. And uh, he does some pretty dark pieces as well. An artist who is extraordinary and I think the most experimental of them all. And finally, this is, I just concluded this to give you um, an idea of the scale. That's Tim Pitsialak who, again, has become very, very well known. Uh, and he's actually, that's Ed Pian, who was up on a uh, residency. And the other part of what's made the Dorset Studios so incredible is that over the years, there's, they have always had a program to try and bring visiting artists up. Uh, in this case, the Toronto Dominion Bank has funded a program where once a year, a northern artist goes south for a residency and a southern artist goes north for a residency because these artists work in isolation. They can't just go out and see what's at the galleries. They, can't, they can, yes, go on the net, they, you know, and they can watch television. But there's very little ability to watch an artist other than your own colleagues working. So it's quite important that they, you know, um, that they, that they actually are exposed to other artists' working methods. Um, this is something that will continue for quite a while. 
So I'm going to stop here. I just to say it's such an unusual phenomenon to have one settlement explode so quickly. And I say it's literally a 10-year period. And I cannot tell you how much energy and how much, um, how much creativity is going on in that space. Uh, there are, I think increasingly, we will have artists who have more time in the South. And certainly from Labrador, artists such as Mark Ilgoliarty, um, who have the ability more to access studios. But as I say, in the high Arctic, I'm afraid it will be a while. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have, we have till three. Yeah. So there's the, that gives us 15 minutes. I can open it up to the floor quickly. I have, we have some time. So does anybody have any questions? No. No. Well, I'll ask a question. Oh, there's a question. I knew, Rhonda. By all means, go ahead. Oui. Attendez, madame, et ensuite, madame. Okay. Here, take the mic because it'll be a bit easier for people to hear you. Hi. Uh, the question is for Greg. I was just hoping that you could tell us about uh, what acquisitions were made by the National Gallery following Sakahan, if any. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Sagahan, Sagahan, uh, one of the aspects of Sagahan is that it was an opportunity to showcase what we've been doing in terms of acquisitions and the internationalization of the indigenous collection. Uh, so there were a lot of acquisitions that were made in the lead up in the five years preceding. Uh, some of the, the most, some of the uh, very notable ones being uh, Jimmy Durham's uh, uh, Encore Tranquillité. Um, the, the the works that I showed, all of them, uh, in the, we're we're making we're still making acquisitions from Sagahan. So there there are quite a few, too many to to name, um, but it's so but it's it's become a very important aspect of of how we're going about um, building the collection. So it's it's like if that is that answer your question, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Euh, bonjour, j'étais euh, absente au début de votre communication. Cependant, j'ai quand même entendu Madame dire que euh, il y avait eu comme un, disons-le simplement, comme un nouveau paradigme dans les dix dernières années euh, au niveau de la production artistique. On avait abandonné un peu une vision euh, traditionnelle ou folklorique pour rendre compte davantage des réalités euh, contemporaines. Ai-je bien compris, Madame? Parce que j'ai une question ensuite. Yeah, so she just wanted to know that the, in the last 10 years, uh, from what she gathered, from what, you're, what you were talking about, there was a paradigm shift from more traditional or folkloric towards something that would be considered more contemporary. Um, is that correct? Uh, I think she wants to follow that up with a question. Bon, c'est correct. Yeah. Alors, ce que j'aimerais savoir, c'est quels sont les facteurs qui ont provoqué ce changement-là. Par exemple, si j'ai bien compris, vous êtes Monsieur Brian Jungen. No. Ah, j'ai très mal compris. C'est Dwayne Linklater. Ah, excusez-moi, monsieur. L'autre. <rire> ah, excusez-moi. Bon, mais c'est ça, c'est que je voulais savoir qu'est-ce qui était arrivé pour qu'en si peu de temps, il y ait ce changement-là. Simply put, she wanted to know what happened for that, what content, what, what, what happened at that time that this was allowed to happen. Je m'excuse, mais je... Je oh, dois écoutez, parler en, en anglais. On est, on est habitué au Québec. <laughs> Faites-vous en pas. Um, it was a combination of, of several factors. Uh, one, I think, increased... The backgrounder would be increased contact with the South because more and more artists were coming down. A generation who was no longer unilingual uh, because now pretty much everybody under 60 is bilingual. Up until then, it was specifically in an octitude. Um, and as I say, more globalization. So I got to Cape Dorset, as, a, as an instance, I got to Cape Dorset four days after 9-11. 
and one of the prominent sculptors I ran into the first day, and she had already created a sculpture of a mourning woman mourning over the children who were made orphans. So, so the globalization, particularly over the last 20 years, and the access to, um, you know, to television and uh, and video. But the real the real Kickstarter was Annie Pudigu, very specifically, was the fact that for drawings, I mean, the prints were doing brilliantly, and all of the, you know, again, Paul Magnick's etchings and aquatints and lithography were brilliant, but they weren't looking at drawing as an end means. And that really, because it, they found it confining. So when Annie proved that you could draw what you wanted, and, st and, and people would love it, you had Chauvenet change her style, Ahotok change his style. Jutai never did draw because he wasn't interested. He was a great sculptor. He only started drawing when he got this freedom. And um, who else did I have? Uh, there are a number of the other ones. So it, there was a background, but the catalyst was Annie Pudigu and her success in the North and the South. Ça va? Merci. Okay. Timekeeper moderator. Great. Um, there's one thing I wanted to bring up uh, in relation to um, something I, I was thinking about in in relation to uh, Dwayne your 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 film with uh, um, your your film with Brian Young and, and also the uh, the the shift brought on in Inuit art and. Um, a bit what we saw in, 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 in Sakahan touched on this as well, is um, this idea of, of modesty. This idea of almost quasi-radical modesty in that it, the, the, even the works that uh, you, you showed, uh, uh, Duane, had this very simple uh, approach to uh, materials, in the case of drawing, into uh, what's actually being depicted in the quotidian. And that has, that anchors it kind of as a, um, in an opposition to what has come to be, what has become the spectacle, the kind of overarching uh, entertainment value associated to contemporary culture in general and contemporary art in, in particular. I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts about that. Um, sure. Uh, well, the, uh, for us, the choice of the word uh, modest in the title was very uh, important. Um, the title of the work is, uh, uh, originates from a court case mar marshal uh, in the East Coast, uh, Nova Scotia, which uh, uh, essentially a judge uh, made a judgment in terms of uh, a treaty right uh, and, and um, used this terminology uh, moderate livelihood. Um, this was the sort of uh, judgment that the the um, case uh, gave. Uh, and so Brian and I like this sort of two words that were together, but we, we felt like the word moderate didn't describe um, us. Um, not only us and the film itself and the ideas that were in the film, but um, um, some of the... Um, uh, other characters or, or uh, people and things that were in the film. Uh, it didn't describe that uh, um, thing. So we decided to change the word from moderate to modest uh, to sort of reflect that shift and sort of reflect the uh, 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 change in determining uh, what kind of a livelihood that we would like to live. Um, and, and modesty, uh, which, I, which I think is actually... Um, uh, in, in, in my thinking right now, and I used the word earlier, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's related to some kind of uh, economy, uh, definitely in terms of what you were saying in some of the works, um, um, you know, an economy of sort of, um, uh, of, of how the things are made or what they're made with. And, and, they're, they're, and within that sort of economy, I think there are very, very important uh, uh, select uh, and distinct and specific choices that are made within the context of, of uh, uh, the relations, the relationship between the art, the artist, and the artworks. Uh, I think the decision-making process is, is a very, very um, uh, finite thing, and I think it's it's 
it's a way in which to um, um, sort of uh, talk about whatever the artist wants to talk about. Usually, um, where does that economy come from, I think, is actually a really important question. Um, and, and I think uh, at this point, I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I think that uh, maybe the uh, what sort of speaks to economy um, uh, might be an important sort of place to think about um, uh, and sort of contextualize uh, uh, indigenous art and, and indigenous contemporary art. I think it's a really kind of important thing. I'm not sure if I'm picking up where you left off, but I, but I, but I did want to say just to pick up actually even on on the previous question, and I think in the context of uh, of an art fair and maybe a lot of viewers that are uninitiated, perhaps to uh, looking at Aboriginal art, Indigenous art, art made by uh, Indigenous artists, that uh, that there's that there's often uh, uh, a layer of interpretation that. That, uh, that, that we try to, uh, where we try to identify and discern what is traditional or customary and what is contemporary, uh, when maybe there's another way to approach the work where we presuppose that it's all contemporary, that it's made by, if it's made by an artist now, it's, it's contemporary art. Um, that, uh, that the uh, watercolors by Chief Henry Speck made in 1956, 1958, 1960s, uh, are contemporary art uh, at that time. That they look like they were made yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah they are said, quite They fresh, look like yeah. they were made yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, when, but sometimes when we look at work like that, that refers specifically to customary practice, to, to what we call traditional, uh, we tend to think of it as, as some traditional form of art, as if it's not a contemporary piece. And, and Ident and, and the whole process of trying to identify those points in time where you can look at something as contemporary or as you know uh, as traditional is maybe uh, doesn't allow us to go into the work and see what's happening in the work. What what is the, what is the artist's intent in the work? Uh, what are they putting forward? Uh, your film, modest livelihood, you know, dealing with with those with those issues. Uh, through the Marshall case and and uh, uh, rights to even even that 's framed you know what what are what are uh, an Indian person's as defined by the Indian Act uh, rights to traditional hunting practices to mm. to be able to make to survive to make to to be able to uh, survive off of off of hunting and fishing so and the judge 's interpretation is well they 're able to make a modest livelihood, you know, you're not you're not able to make, you're not able to become uh, 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 beyond that. So there is a, de a determination in there, an interpretation of, of a treaty right uh, and and a delineation in that act. So there's, so but one could view your film uh, uh, and think, well, it's a film about about a traditional practice. It's about hunting, and not and not be able to get beyond that. So I think. Uh, I, I, don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there, and uh, and that it's also part of. Uh, it's it's always a subtext of of looking at indigenous art, and it's something that uh, that we you know you can call out and and think about and discuss as well. So. Just, just a little bit. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, the, the very very simple question, uh, and just in general for for not only indigenous arts but for contemporary art in general is what is contemporary uh, and, and sort of I've, I've thought about this question a lot um, in regards to my own work and other people's works and uh, trying to sort of provide myself some kind of lens to 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 look uh, and, and in one of the the uh, um, uh, sort of uh, people that I've been reading and, and thinking about uh, and there are many many people that sort of ponder on this question but I think one of the people that, that I, I came to sort of uh, uh, some kind of uh, a closeness to was Boris Groys, uh, uh, what is the contemporary and, and his sort of uh, interpretation of contemporary being something that has, to, it's a German word, um, but the, essentially the translation of the German word is uh, um, a, a, 
an artist, a contemporary artist who makes contemporary art is someone who uh, is, is somehow related to time and makes work as a result of being related or in relation to time. And, and I think that a lot of the works that you've shown and, and also that you've shown sort of, uh, for me anyways, in, in relation to this idea of what is the contemporary or what is contemporary, I think that a lot of these works sort of fall into uh, um, uh, into that sort of uh, place where, or near that space of, of that kind of idea of contemporary and what it is. Um, and, and artists who sort of are very aware of their contexts and uh, um, where and when and how uh, um, they're, they're, they're making art. So these, these are things that I think about uh, a lot, but I, I think that it definitely for me is not uh, um, some kind of fixed position as well. Great. I think we're going to have to wrap it up, unless there's another question. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Quelqu'un voudrait suivre? Oui, oui, uh, oui. I have no idea about that. I'm sorry. Oh, right. Uh, Ron, do you have a last question? No? Quickly? Uh, Oh, okay, um, maybe we'll pick it up. Do we? Can, no, we have to wrap. We have to wrap. So maybe in, con in conversation around. Thank you very much, everybody. Merci tout le monde d'être là. Et puis, uh, bonne fin de foire. Merci.